Well, to prevent our children from being exposed, and normally this time in the service we bless our children, so it's interesting I'm starting to talk about children, but usually to prevent our children from being exposed to danger like, well, like if, for example, the storms that we encountered uh, the other night. We tell them to stay in the house. And why do we tell them to stay in the house? Well, because, as we know, our houses are a place of refuge. A house is a place of comfort. A house is a place of safety and security. Now, many for the past few weeks have been doing just that. They have been staying in their houses to avoid the danger of possibly being infected by the Wuhan Chinese virus. Rabbi Shaul, in his first letter to Corinth, expressed the following. Reading, I'm going to read normally from the Complete Jewish Bible, but for this scripture, I'm going to read from the Living Bible Translation. Reading from chapter 10, again from the first letter to Corinth, verse 11. All these things happen to them as examples, as object lessons to us, to warn us against doing the same things so we could read about them and learn from them in these last days as the world nears its end. You see, in verse 11, what he's been doing up until verse 11, for the first 10 verses, Rabbi Shul is as example to the people who are listening to him, five experiences for his audience that the children of Israel had in the wilderness and how that in each and every case there were for them object lessons for those reading his letter then and of course for us reading his letter today. From our special portion for Shemot, or from Shemot I should say, for Hakamatzot. I want to share this morning some pertinent object lessons that have a special significance in the season that we as a congregation, as a community, as a state, as a nation are reckoning with. Referring to the first two verses from today's parasha, we read the emphasis seems to be on the door and the door frame and the blood, and then eventually shifts to the house. And what results <clears throat> from the attention that they give to the blood and the door affects the entire house. Let me say that again. What results from all the attention that they're giving to the door frame and the blood will affect the entire house. The idea is that if the death angel is unable to get past the door, if he's unable to pass through the door, therefore the death angel will be unable to access the house. Now, there are Jewish scholars that insist originally that the Pesach or the Passover lamb was actually killed right there at the door of the house. And there are some good reasons for believing that this might be true. One reason is that there exists some ancient uh, art that depicts this taking place. This art, usually of course art of its day, was carved in stone, shows a person with a knife in his hand and he is obviously standing in the doorway of what is, in this case, assumed to be the doorway of his house. And there there is the lamb at his feet, and he is reaching down to cut the lamb's throat. Now in this case, the blood of the lamb was not caught in a basin. It was not caught in a basin, but drained from the lamb's throat directly onto the threshold of that door. And then it was taken at that point and splashed on the doorpost and on the lintel. Now there's a reason to believe that this may be true, that the lamb was sacrificed right at the doorway, because the Hebrew word saf, translated in some versions threshold, is also translated as basin. 
And the similarity is so striking that when the Jews involved Greek scholars to translate the Torah into Greek, called today the Septuagint, that version translates that word into threshold rather than basin. So if this is true, and it seems there is a strong chance of it being true, then in order to go through the door, the death angel would have been surrounded by the blood of the Lamb. So it was on the threshold and on both doorposts and on the lintel as well. Everywhere there was blood. Now there was something mentioned here we just kind of passed over, pardon the pun, and that was in verse 22. While instructing about the blood in the door, Moshe says the following, None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock? No, morning. Now, the question is, why were they not allowed to go out? And why, when they were allowed to go out, did it have to be in the morning? I want to read from you from Tehillim again, Psalms 105, verse 23 to 38. I'll give you a moment if you'd like to follow along in your scriptures. It's a complete Jewish Bible translation. 105, verse 23 to 38, Tehillim. Then Israel too came into Egypt. Yaakov or Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham. There God made his people very fruitful, made them too numerous, too numerous for their foes, whose hearts he turned to hate his people and treat his servants unfairly. He sent his servant Moshe and Aharon, whom he had chosen. They worked his signs among them, his wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness, and the land grew dark. They did not defy his word. He turned their water into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs. Even in the royal chambers he spoke, and there came swarms of insects and lice throughout their land. He gave them hail instead of rain with fiery lightning throughout their land. He struck their vines and fig trees, shattering trees all over the country. He spoke, and locusts came, and also grasshoppers without number. And they ate up everything green in their land, devoured the fruit of their ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their strength. And then he led his people out, laden with silver and gold. And among his tribes, not one stumbled. Egypt was happy to have them leave, because fear of Israel had seized them. Now it's interesting what is said in verse 27, where it says, they worked his deber, is the word in Hebrew. They worked his deber, or signs, among them. See, that can literally be translated, the words of his signs. Brothers and sisters, there was instruction going on. There was teaching that was going on. A lot of times we think of signs and wonders, we think of experiences. We rarely think of signs in the context of actual instruction or teaching. But that's exactly what's going on there. There was instruction in what was taking place. There was teaching in what was going on there. And that would include with it the demands that Moshe and Aharon made. The warnings that God gave to Moshe and Aharon to give to Pharaoh in his court as well. Those things that preceded every plague that came along. And it is possible indeed, I, I think it's highly probable that the average everyday Egyptian heard in advance <clears throat> that final prophecy, the Baruchot Choshech, the slaying of all the, the firstborns. That right? No, no, that's the uh, that's the, uh, uh, the darkness. I always get that mixed up. Yeah, it's the slaying of the firstborn. Par pardon the rabbi in that one. Because, see, it says here that the fear of Israel had seized them. The fear of Israel had seized them because they knew that they knew that every time Moshe declared something, guess what? It happened. It happened. 
It was almost like they had a death sentence over them, and all they could do was wait around and see what would be going down next. Now, the locals were not given the instruction that Israel was privy to, to put the blood around the doorposts. But it makes me wonder that even the Egyptians, who were by this time learned to take Moshe seriously, might they not have covered their doorposts as well with the blood of a lamb? I would not be surprised because, remember, brothers and sisters, it was a mixed multitude that went out of Egypt with Israel. And I'm sure that the average Egyptian by this time were wondering about safety. They were wondering about deliverance. They were wondering how this awesome force could be turned aside or away from them. You know, I said it just a little bit earlier, reference to Shemot or Exodus 12, 22, that the door represented the whole house. So it was not necessary for the whole house to be painted with blood. It was just the doorway. And all that was necessary was for one part, the place where you went in, to be painted around the edges with blood. So, in saying that, what we have here, for those who are educated, it's a literary device. And I'm sure my wife looking at me probably knows what it is because she used to read the dictionary. What we have here is called metonymy. The metonymy. Yes, even I'm educated. And what that means is that one part of something represents the whole. That just one part of something represents the whole. Often, you might hear it in a derogatory sense. Like if I said suits, what do you think of? You think of executives, right? White collar executives. If I was to say uh, the track, what are you thinking of? Race track, horse racing. So I'm just talking about the track, but it engulfs all the rider jockeys and the horses and all the attendants there. If I said the law, which I've used recently, we're referencing what? The police. It's the law. It's the police. It's the police department and all the laws that they enforced. That's metonymy. So, again, in other words, the door is representative of the entire house. Now, every once in a while, scripturally, you're going to find the term household. For example, if we go to the beginning of the Torah, we go to Brashit or Genesis 7, 1, Adonai says to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your bait or household, for I have seen that you alone in this generation are righteous before me. Here we go, we have another metonymy. Because the word literally in Hebrew, bait, is house. Bring your house into the ark. Bring it into my household, if you may. Well, Noah is not going to bring his house into the ark. But he did bring what it contained. What his house contained, what is his family. Now our English word house has a pretty interesting origin to it. According to the origin of English words, house is derived from a root word that means hollow. It means covering. It means tie or hide or it means to conceal. Hollow, cover, hide, or conceal. For example, many of you uh, are Second Amendment people, you, hey, you have pistols. So when you put the pistol in generally, you put it into a holster. Holster comes from the same root as house. Helmet, you know, we're all hoping we're gonna get a football season this year. Helmet is what players you know, wear, as well as men of war wear helmets. And that word helmet comes to the same root as house. Traditionally, what used to be traditionally, you don't see it so much, we don't see it so much in the furniture business anymore, which I do part-time. One, one of the things you see disappearing from the furniture, you know, selection is hutches. You don't have hutches anymore because people aren't buying fine china anymore. 
and, and we, you would take that fine china and you would put it into your hutch. Well, again, hutch comes from the same root as house. How about what you lay, wear on your legs and your feet? Socks and hose, right? Hosiery. Hosiery, again, comes from the same root as house. So as you can see, every one of these words has within it the idea of enclosure. And it gives you the idea that something is contained within something else. So you get the basic idea then that the word house is a receptacle that holds or contains something within it. And throughout the Bible we find then that certain words are used interchangeably. A perfect example for us right now, the season that we're in, is Passover. As you know, the word Pesach or Passover and, and unleavened bread are used interchangeably in the Bible, thus indicating a season sometimes rather than a specific day. So whatever the context permits them, sometimes the translators will use just one word. Sometimes they'll use another word. But the Hebrew word will mean essentially the same thing. For example, from our Ketavei Hashachim portion, that Rochelle read from Kepha, we see from this verse that God is judging his house, and that judgment has already begun on his house. So he's not upset the way it was constructed. He's judging what's inside of the house. Amen? Kepha or Peter identifies people of the way with God's house by using the pronoun us. Therefore, as I said, the house of God is God's children, his followers, his, and, and those are his. Those who are disobedient and not part of us, well, they are not part of God's house. Very frequently in the New Testament or the apostolic writings, the word house is used in the same sense as household or family or kehilat. Now, as far as I've gotten so far in this drosh, don't let what I first began with, with the Shemot 12, verse 22 and 23, leave your mind. The house, the blood, the door, and so on. Because I'm going to transition a little bit here. In his first letter, Kepha, or Peter, says the following in chapter 2, verse 5. You yourselves, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be Kohanim, set apart for God, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to him through Yeshua the Messiah. So our metaphor is starting to shift a little bit here. The house, of course, is still in the picture, but in this case, though, we, those who are part of the house, are now identified scripturally as living stones. And we as living stones are being built together into a spiritual house. Here, house is being used as a structure. And the structure, if you think of it as a building, like a home in which we live, is alive. Now that is a little bit different than structures we normally think of as being a house. Not only that, but as a living stone, you are joined, of course, to other living stones within that structure. So the believer is part of a structure that is also a community to which he has responsibilities because he is tied to these other living stones as part of the same community or structure. Again, this letter from Rabbi Shaul to Corinth, his first letter, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Don't you know that you, don't you know I just know when he says that, he's, he, he's exasperated. That's when he wrote this first letter, he was exasperated. He was frustrated with what was going on in Corinth. So he's saying to the fact that, don't you know that you people are God's people, are God's temple? You people are God's temple. And that God's spirit lives in you. So if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you yourselves are that temple. So he's doing a little correction there. He's doing a little, you know, a little rebuking there. See, the Greek word, naos, translated temple, comes from a root that means to dwell. 
So in the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, the temple was seen as God's dwelling place. The temple, though, was not intended to be a place for public access. It was not. That's what the synagogues were for. They assembled and heard Torah taught at the synagogue, but God lived in the temple. His presence could be found in the temple. Are you starting to get the picture? I'm hoping we are the temple and God lives in us. We are God's dwelling place now. The only way to get into God's dwelling place is to go through the door that has the blood around it. Once we are in it, we begin to find that we have certain responsibilities. And those responsibilities primarily surround the perfecting of this one stone. And that one stone is us. The perfecting of us. Working in conjunction with God, who is co-laboring with us, that we might be polished up and be made a, a jewel within his building. So he labors with us that this might take place, and, but we have a great deal of control in that over what is produced because we can go the easy way. We can go the easy way. You have free will. You can do it the easy way and do virtually nothing, or we can go the hard way, and we can expend all our efforts on these things that are really difficult and costly. Rabbi Shaul, again, in his letter to Ephesus, he says in chapter 2, 19 to 22, So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. On the contrary, you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's family. You have been built on the foundation of the emissaries and the prophets, with the cornerstone being Yeshua the Messiah himself. In union with him, the whole building is held together. And it is growing into a holy temple in union with the Lord. Yes, in union with him, you yourselves are being built together into a spiritual dwelling place for God. Brothers and sisters, we all know that we are a work in progress. We are being built into the temple. So what we see then from this section here is a process an ongoing project so that we are not only the house, we are working on the house. And I can relate to that. And we are being worked on at the same time to make us fit better within the house. Now, the word temple that is used here more specifically means inner sanctuary, the holy place or the holy of holies. And the purpose of all this work is that the house may be a fit place for God to dwell in by His Spirit. Rabbi Shaul adds another thing here that is interesting, and that is that we are fellow citizens with God's people. Fellow citizens. And that's a, a touchy word these days, is it not? Well, citizenship indicates a political entity as well. See, this house then, or building, or temple or family is also a kingdom that requires citizenship. You just can't cross the border and be here. You're not a citizen. You don't belong here. You didn't enter through the appropriate doorway. You see how all of these usages of these words both in the Tanakh and the apostolic writings are starting to come together for us into something that is multifaceted, and yet, actually, on the other hand, pretty simple. There's a very clear lesson in everything that I've talked about so far. So I want to look at a particular part of the building that we covered back at the beginning of the message. I want to focus our attention back on the door. And I want to read from you from Yochanan, or John, chapter 10, verse 1. Yes, indeed, I tell you, the person who doesn't enter the sheep pen through the door, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. Think that translates today at our southern border? So then in verse 7, So Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed, I tell you that I am the gate or the door for the sheep. And then he goes on in verse 9 and 10, 
I am the gate or the door. If someone enters through me, he will be safe and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only in order to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come so that they may have life, life in its fullest measure. You see how scripture can be applied in our contemporary world very, very easily. Principles are principles. So, what's a sheep pen? What, now, some of you have grown up in rural environments. Not everybody knows what a sheep pen is. A sheep pen is a receptacle. It's basically a shelter for, che for sheep. It's a holding place for sheep. It's a place of refuge and security for the sheep. And it's very interesting that in Israel, a sheep pen customarily only had one entrance to it. One entrance. And that is why it was such a vivid lesson to these people in their day. All the community sheep were only kept in one sheep pen, and they could only get in by one opening. Now, there was a reason for that. It's because each true shepherd felt it was his responsibility to evaluate each sheep as it went by him. Having only one door, only one way to get in, enabled him to evaluate the sheep after they had been out in the pasture, out into the world, if you may. He could look them over to see if there's any sores, if there's any insects or infections or contamination, or anything else that he needed to tend to. In addition to that, it made it a much safer place, being that there was only one door, and usually what happened was, uh, at the end of the day, as night fell, one of the shepherds would sleep right across the door. Now, it did not mean that in the actual situation that the same shepherd was there every night, no. But in our situation as followers of Yeshua, the same shepherd is there all the time. But in theirs, they would rotate the job and make sure that in order for a thief to get in there, he'd actually had to go right past the shepherd if he was going to get at the sheep. So he laid down his life, the shepherd did. Every night he'd lay down his life, and that indicates protection. That indicates care. See, a shepherd's main responsibility, brothers and sisters, and I'm talking about real shepherds in this case, is the health of his sheep. That's his responsibility, the health and well-being of the sheep. Now, in the case of a minister, rabbi, pastor, his primary responsibility to God is to promote and protect the integrity of the flock. A true shepherd will do that, and in doing so, he greatly ensures the salvation of the sheep that are in his care. And under his protection, then, with the gifts that God gives him, he enables them to safely continue in working out their salvation in a healthy, truthful, biblical way. Psalm 92, verses 12 to 13. The righteous will flourish like palm trees. They will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of Adonai. They will flourish in the courtyards of our God. See, those who are planted and are firmly attached shall flourish because God lives there and he is the master of his family. Brothers and sisters, people of the way are indestructible because God has promised that each one of us as a living stone has a responsibility and where we stand in relation to carrying out the responsibility is the basis of our hope. See, the shepherd, he's there at the door. He will follow through with what he promises to do. All we have to do is respond to him and do what we need to do. And what we need to do, especially in these days, brothers and sisters, is hold fast. Now, you may wonder for how long. I don't know. I don't know exactly. I can only remain expectant and watchful just like everybody else, but I can say this, in the symbolism that is given in the Bible, every single one of us has to hold fast until morning comes when the day star arises. That's a real pretty picture. 
Because, see, his mercies are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. So once you go through the doorway of life and you pass between the blood, you stay there until morning, until the day star comes. And someday, we are promised the light of the world will come. And when he comes, either whether we're dead or and secure in our graves, or we have held on until then, or we are alive and we have held on until that time. The other night, you might remember, several tornadoes had uh, touched down in our area. Think about how stupid it would have been. Would we have to edge the house in the midst of those storms? See, regardless of how dark our world appears, regardless of how much turmoil we hear outside, regardless of how much wailing we hear outside, make sure one thing is that you stay behind that door and you stay where you are. Your physical house won't give you the safety that you're looking for. It's God's house that will provide you the safety. The long-term safety, the eternal safety. Where there's danger outside, there's safety in the house. There's security in the house. There's protection in the house. Stay in the house. Stay in God's house. Don't leave. Outside of God's covering, there's danger. There's sickness. There's disease. And for some, even death. Make sure that you remain in the Father's house until morning, behind that blood-stained door. Take advantage of being behind the door to work, to reinforce, and even build your faith, remembering what you are. Never forgetting what you were. Appreciating the awesome cost of salvation. This Pesach season and the days that follow, I want to challenge you this Shabbat and this Hakkabat so to resist every pull that will entice or maybe even scare you to leave. Brothers and sisters, from this moment on, stay in God's house. Stay in the blood covered shepherd watched home. Amen. Yerech Yahweh v'yishmarecha T'adonai panavalecha v'chaneicha T'adonai panavalecha V'sim lecha bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord will lift his countenance upon you, and that he would grant you his shalom, his safety, his security. Amen.